today, in the bright springtime of 1970, the United States of America has been ripped apart. Citizens bludgeon each other in the streets of New York. Students die in a campus eruption. Buildings explode. Banks burn. The nation's colleges are shut down. The population is polarized, and there are parades of protest everywhere. Not since the days of the Civil War have Americans treated each other like this. At the heart of the trouble lies the war in Vietnam. It is a strange war, a war that we have to keep explaining to ourselves year after year after year. And it is a difficult war to explain, particularly to the people who have to go and fight on its inconclusive battlefields. But while all the talk goes on, the war goes on too. It continues tonight as it has continued for a decade. Tonight, Americans will die in Vietnam. Tonight, Americans will die in Cambodia. What can we do? On the day before we went into Cambodia, Amendment Number 609 was introduced on the floor of the United States Senate. It was co-sponsored by a bipartisan coalition of 20 senators. These Republicans and Democrats call it the Amendment to End the War. They regard it as a realistic new thrust for peace. The Senate debate on it will begin in just a few days. In the next half hour, five of these senators will make a case for this amendment. If the American people can effectively urge its passage upon the members of the House and Senate, if the amendment to end the war is passed, then the traditional right of declaring whether or not we shall commit Americans to battle will be returned to the Congress where it belongs. Through protest, petition, and an act of law, we shall have at last ended the Vietnam War. There is no way under the Constitution by which the Congress of the United States can act either to continue this war or to end it except by a decision on whether we will appropriate funds uh, to finance the war. Article 1, uh, Section 8 of the Constitution reads as follows. The Congress shall have power to raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. Our amendment to end the war fulfills the obligations that we have under the Constitution. The amendment clearly states that unless the Congress shall have declared war, that no monies appropriated on the act to which we attach the amendment or any other law shall be used in Vietnam after December the 30th, 1970, except for the withdrawal of American troops and other provisions. It provides that no money shall be used for military operations in the country of Laos after December of 1970. It provides that no monies shall be authorized for the use of any military operations in Cambodia 30 days following the adoption of the amendment and that all troops shall be withdrawn from Vietnam, all American troops, by June 1971, unless the President of the United States shall deem it is important enough to extend that time by requesting the Congress to pass a joint resolution authorizing such extension time. The amendment to end the war provides continuing funding for full protection of American troops during the total period of our withdrawal. It also provides adequate funding to provide political asylum for all those South Vietnamese and other civilians for which there may be great concern about a bloodbath. And there are adequate provisions that these civilians may be placed in other places for their own protection. It also provides for a continuing negotiation of exchange of prisoners. Very soon, the Senate will be acting on another amendment offered by Senator Cooper and myself, which is addressed to the Cambodian situation and sets the limits on that adventure to those declared by the President. But this End the War Amendment takes the full step and provides an orderly method for the extrication of the United States from the war in Vietnam itself. And so what we're looking for is a reasonable way uh, to accomplish uh, that withdrawal. 
And I think that the principal stumbling block now is that we're somehow worried about losing face. We're worried about embarrassing the policy makers that sent us in there. We're worried about admitting that perhaps uh, we've made a mistake. Actually, I think it would contribute to the greatness of the United States if, as a free people, we could just admit that we're capable of making a mistake and then do the best we can to put an early end to it. Vietnamization is not a change in policy at all. It's a continuation of the old, old policy. It is dedicated to war, not peace. It means that the war will go on and continue to go on for years to come. It means that there has been no one speaking in this administration or the last of an end to our support commitment in Vietnam. It means that we can look into the future for at least a decade, in all probability, to a quarter of a million men involved in Vietnam. I think every mother and father in America who has a son right now that's five or six or seven years old or anywhere up to 15 or 16 should well realize that that boy is going to be involved in our future commitment in Vietnam under existing policy. We have come to the point where uh, we realize, and I think the president realized when he went into Cambodia, that Vietnamization will not work. And it was an admission of the failure of Vietnamization. I think it's time that the American people recognize that uh, the president doesn't have the power to declare war or make war alone. He can ask Congress to declare that. And I think that's why what we are discussing here and urging support from the American people for is so important. Congress can do this, and it's not an irresponsible action. And uh, with the walls all falling down around American prestige and power in the world, if we decide we're going to get out, Congress would simply be saying, okay, we've fought for seven years, we've bled and died, and we've spent our resources on this, and now the time has come to say to the South Vietnamese, take it over. We'll give you time. Over a period of time, we're going to be withdrawing. And you can go on getting aid if you fight for yourself in your own civil war. We're not going to stay there and fight and bleed and die for you any longer. But the point is simply this. It's no longer the opinion of presidents and no longer the opinion of senators. It's the evidence of history of over 40,000 deaths and this amount of resource expended that has proven each one of those escalations to be wrong. And I say, how many more American men have to be heaped upon that funeral pyre of war to disprove a theory or a doctrine of military action that has been proven wrong each time that has been acted upon? After all, the United States is not going to impose any permanent solution in Asia to settle Asian problems among Asian people on the Asian mainland. Now, the idea that we are going to do that is, uh, runs against the whole current of history. What's happening in Asia is that the Western powers are moving out and that the Asians are taking over for themselves. And uh, Vietnamization, as it's been pointed out here, is not the method for extricating us from this morass. It will merely perpetuate our involvement in this war. Half of the troops may come home, the other half will stay indefinitely. And it does not serve the interests of the United States to maintain a permanent military base in Southeast Asia. Right. The president reiterated the other night that he was going to continue to uh, bring back these 150,000 men in the next 12 months. Now, many uh, Americans may feel that uh, that means they're all going to be coming back and nobody's going to be going. Under a policy of bringing back 150,000 men in the next 12 months, we will send to South Vietnam, 276,000 men who are not there now, who are now in the military or about to go into the military, and uh, we'll bring back more, 150,000 more than we send, but in the rotation process, there will be this 276,000 men go <coughs> over there to fight and perhaps die. And what, and what would we have accomplished? Well, what evidence is there based on past history uh, to lead us to believe that we would be in any better position or that South Vietnam would be in any better position one year or five years or ten years hence after tens of thousands of additional Americans have been killed than we are now. What would we have gained? Uh, we have created a, a crisis of confidence and a deep disillusionment and an alienation 
that doesn't just affect the narrow fringe of, uh, of radicals on campus. It, anyone who goes to the campuses knows that this feeling extends to millions of young Americans. Now, if they grow up without a belief in this system, that, it seems to me, has far greater bearing upon the future of the United States than anything we have now or have ever had at stake out in Indochina. I think one of the great tragic byproducts of all of this has been the spiritual scarring of our own people, the questioning of our own minds, where we're involved in a body count war with total military supremacy with indiscriminate bombing and far-ranging effects on the ecology of those nations by spraying chemicals and driving the people off of the land into the cities, completely changing the complex of that little nation involving 16 to 18 million people. And we ask ourselves, can we be happy about the fact that we've killed 10,000 Vietnamese and suffered 300 deaths ourselves in, in the process that uh, this complete uh, psychology that we have of destroying life, you know, at any expense, and, and what the results of it are... Brutalizing our own society. It's it? brutalizing us internally, and we find our young people turning away from it, fleeing to Canada to avoid a war they consider immoral and attitudes that they consider unrealistic in a time and an age of, of where we really are questing ourselves to find national purpose again. What, uh, what we need to understand is that there is no way to separate the cost of this war in Asia from the cost of our own society. Now, there were stories uh, in the press recently that some of our poor people, some of the uh, uh, black citizens and other minority groups uh, have shied away from participating in protests against the war on the grounds that their concerns are with hunger and with racism and with poverty. But what I think all of our fellow Americans need to understand is that the answer to these other problems will not come until we put this war behind us and the enormous drain that it's uh, taking here in our society. The person who's worried about inflation ought to realize that war is a principal cause of it. The man who's worried about the stock market uh, skidding ought to realize that the stock market jitters are associated to a great extent uh, with the war. And as you've said so many times, the governors and the uh, city councilmen and others who are worried about where the money's going to come from for those new schools or new sewage projects or other things, they have to understand that the war is robbing them of those possibilities. We're talking about a 16 to 18 million people in South Vietnam. We have 23 million blacks in America who have not been able to find justice in this great country. Untold thousands of American Indians who have never been brought to their fulfillment. Uh, you who have worked so long and so energetic in the field of hunger in America and poverty with some 35 million people living in pocket poverty with the very foundation shaking uh, of every major city in the nation with uh, the great basic uh, undergirding of this nation that has always kept it stable with those minorities is now being drained off and siphoned off in the name of somehow saving face in Southeast Asia. You know, so when we talk, uh, I, I think you would agree that there seems to be a great paradox in this. The cost of the war last year was $23 billion. So you can say in just about specific terms that one year's cost of this war would clean up all our waters in the United States. The half hour that this program is being kept telecast to the American public, to reduce that or to translate that in terms of the cost of the war, the federal government will be spending one million dollars just in this one half hour period. In Vietnam. In Vietnam. Just in Vietnam. But Mark, you know the argument is made that the world will think we're weak if we withdraw from Vietnam. I, I think that uh, of all the arguments that are made, I, that is the, um, the least impressive. Actually, the world knows we have the power to exterminate every living inhabitant of Vietnam if we unloosed that power. We could salt it over the way Rome salted over Carthage. Uh, it's not our power that's in question out there. It's the wisdom of our policy. 
and the world sees a, the, the biggest, richest, strongest nation dropping more bombs on North Vietnam than we dropped in all of Europe in the Second World War. They see this tremendous disproportion of strength and wealth. And that puts us in a very bad light in the world. In fact, this war has done more to undermine America's moral leadership in the world than anything that's ever happened to us. And the faster we put the matter right in Southeast Asia, and end this war, the sooner we will begin to win back again the respect that this country ought to have throughout the world. What do you say to people who are really concerned, and I know they're concerned, about the fact that we'll lose face in the world, you know, that, uh, you know, really will not be a first-rate power, as has been implied by our chief executives in the past and in the present? And the concern of the honest Americans who want to get out of the war, who want to stop the killing and the dying. And yet they say this is America's place in the world, that unless we accept this challenge, we're somehow failing in world leadership. I think this is the question in the minds of millions of Americans today. What constitutes leadership? Uh, not just power uh, of armament, but power of ideals. I say that we are losing in the world today by continuing to be in Vietnam. <clears throat> it's not a matter of national pride. It's a matter of whether we're practicing what we preach. It's a matter of whether our ideals that were embodied in the Constitution in the hearts of the American people are really at the center of our policy or whether we're out here with some peripheral object of, of face saving and so forth. I say if it's to be humiliated to admit we're wrong and to save lives, then the sooner we do this, the better it's going to be for our nation. But I don't consider it humiliation. I consider it greatness because the, only the powerful can take the chance of admitting error, and we're that powerful today. And most uh -huh. civilizations that have died have died from within. And that is happening now in the United States of America if we don't get out of this war. We clothe this war, war, war in the sacred words of justice and freedom and peace. But justice and freedom and peace aren't at stake out there. You know, the government we're supporting is not a democratic government. It's an incompetent and corrupt military dictatorship. <coughs> and it's involved in a war with another dictatorship. This is a war <coughs> between two dictatorships for control of Vietnam. So I think we make a grave mistake when we try to clothe such a war. In, um, in terms of, of the ideals for which this country should stand. Freedom is not at issue for the people of Vietnam. One way or the other, the kind of freedom we know is not going to be uh, the gift of this war out there. I think the gut question, though, Frank, and, and particularly George, and we're talking about this amendment to end the war, uh, to most Americans is how can I support this amendment? and at the same time support my country in an involvement we've had over the last 15 years. And I think if people could resolve this in their own minds, you know, they'd very willingly bring this war to an end through this amendment. Now, the president said the other night that if we uh, leave Vietnam now, we're going to be through, or I think he said we're going to be finished as a peacemaker in Asia. Well, now, I think we ought to quit trying to be uh, the policeman for Asia. Let's quit trying to be a solo uh, policeman uh, and banker uh, and pacifier uh, in Asia alone. How ironic it would be if at long last we succeeded in uh, pacifying Southeast Asia and couldn't pacify our own society. The invasion of Cambodia, I think, was truly the straw that broke the camel's back. They're writing to me at about 8 to 10 to 1 against the president's posture right now in Southeast Asia, and in the belief and the hope that the Senate of the United States will offer the leadership, you know, to alter this posture. Everything we have said here tonight is completely unpartisan. I think we have all been as critical of the Democratic presidents as we have of Republican presidents, and we should not be considering this in terms of a political or partisan advantage one way or another. This war transcends partisanship. And uh, I know a great many Republicans as well as Democrats who think our policy now is wrong and we ought to get out. I think the overwhelming number of all Americans, whatever their political party, believe this. Sure. I think what we're trying to do 
uh, with our amendment to end the war is to say that that is too important a decision to place on the shoulders of one man. It's too big a risk to ask one man to decide alone. The president ought not to have to make that judgment alone. And under the Constitution, he's not supposed to make that decision alone. What we're proposing to do is to share that responsibility and whatever political risk, whatever opportunity, whatever hazard is involved in making the decision to end this war, we're prepared as elected officials to stand up on that question and answer yes or no and then take whatever blame or whatever credit is involved. In effect, we're providing a situation where the president can withdraw faster, where he can make a determination the war is going to end by a fixed date, and he will not bear the whole onus himself. We recognize that when you've made such a tragic mistake, there's no painless way to get out of that mistake. We're saying we'll share that pain, we'll share that responsibility, uh, but let's recognize the mistake and get out of it. What do we say to the American parents who have sons fighting in Vietnam? Is this a patriotic move that we are taking in this amendment to end the war? Is this support of their sons and of our fighting men in Vietnam? There is no better way than to protect the young men who are fighting over there than to bring them home. And I don't know of any military person in any uh, responsible position who doubts that if we made our declaration we're coming out, that they would be brought home safely. And as long as we stay there, the casualties are going to go up. And if President Nixon's program works over the next three years, we are talking about a minimum of 5,000 more American dead and probably closer to 20,000, four or five times that many casualties and four or five times that many Vietnamese deaths in the process, not to mention the billions of dollars involved. But now what we're proposing is not a disorganized uh, and uncoordinated outcry. We're proposing a specific legislative act that will have the full force of law, and it will say, in effect, no more money for Southeast Asia for any purpose other than arranging for the systematic and safe uh, withdrawal of our forces for the exchange of prisoners, for asylum for those people that might be threatened by our withdrawal. It's an orderly constitutional procedure for bringing about an end to this war. Uh, this brings the Congress back to the role that it should have been playing all along. It asks the Congress to assume, assume its responsibility to the American people and it brings our democratic system back to life again in a balanced constitutional manner. And uh, that in itself is as important in the long run to the life of this republic as ending the war in Vietnam. What do we say to the American people who have been watching and who would say, well, we agree with you, but uh, our voice is not very loud. We're only one, I'm only one person. I'm just a little person, so-called little person. You hear that many times. Does that voice have a, a place in this whole great issue of war and peace? They say, we're tired of speeches. We want some action. A lot of the young people say this to us. A lot of the older people say, all right, turn it off. Uh, we, we agree with you, but what have you done about it? What can you do about it? What can we do? We're asking people to make their views known responsibly to their congressmen, and we're asking the Congress and the Senate of the United States particularly to begin to assume its responsibility under the Constitution. For years and years now, we've abdicated. We've given all the power to the president when it came to war. We've sat on our hands and done nothing and hoped that the people would look the other way. Well, the time has come to reassert our responsibility and to stand up and vote on the question of war or peace. You know, we have sort of enshrined silence as the virtue of patriotism in the last uh, year or so. And actually, I think the highest patriotic duty that any citizen has is to speak up, to speak his convictions and his mind. Now, that's the hope that we've got to give to all American people that there is this method, there is this channel open to them, and that we and others like us on this end of the power structure, so to speak, are receptive. We're not only receptive, but we're inviting them to participate in this amendment in the war. This is what we must do, that we need their help. Even if we had 40 senators presently on this amendment, we need the help of the people of the United States. There's no other way that we can succeed. 
And the voice of the people counts in the final analysis if I'm to exercise my judgment and to follow my conscience in a position of responsibility. I must tell the people when I think we're right and I must tell them when I think we're wrong and expect them to support those positions or to oppose them. But for Lord's sake, don't be quiet. Right, support or oppose, but do something in this critical time. If you want to cast your vote to end the war in Indochina, there is something you must do in the next few days. Write to your congressman or your senator. Just the simple words, I vote for the amendment to end the war in Southeast Asia. And there's something else you can do. Take a sheet of paper and write at the top, we, the undersigned, favor the amendment to end the war. Leave room for names and addresses. And then go out to work, to the church, to the supermarket, wherever you can collect signatures and get people to sign who agree with you. Send those petitions to your congressmen and to your senators. The President of the United States rightfully can command all media to bring a message to the people of the United States any time he deems he has a message of importance. For those of us who have differing viewpoints and wish to express those to you, the American people, it requires that we seek your assistance. Remember that 66 cents out of every tax dollar now goes for war. A dollar for peace could go a long way. So send your contribution, whatever it may be, in order that we can continue to speak out. Make your checks out to Amendment to End the War, Post Office Box 1A, Ben Franklin Station, Washington, D.C. Let me close this broadcast on a very concrete and specific point. What we are proposing here is that for the first time in the long history of this war, the Senate of the United States stand up and be counted yes or no on the question of whether we wish the war to continue or to be ended. We propose to do that in a vote that will come in a very short time we pledge you that that vote will be held. This is not a sense of the Congress resolution. It is not a debater's point. It is an act of law which, if carried, will put an end to this war in a systematic way. We ask earnestly tonight for your support in that effort. every area of the world. In 1968, a new phase is now starting. The General Westmoreland strategy is producing results. The enemy's hopes are dim. If when the chips are down, the world's most powerful nation acts like a pitiful, helpless giant, in just a few days, debate on the amendment to end the war will begin on the floor of the United States Senate. If the American people can effectively urge its passage upon the members of the House and Senate, if the amendment to end the war is passed, then the traditional right of declaring whether or not we shall commit Americans to battle will be returned to the Congress, where it belongs. Through protest, petition, and an act of law, we shall have at last ended the Vietnam War.